Thanks, Martha, for the kind introduction and for uh, having me here in this uh, special lecture hall and to speak to all of you. I wear many hats because I need it now. <laughs> um, but the topic I want to tell you about is um, really the heart and soul of our research. Why is the young brain so malleable and why does it become harder to change um, with age, or does it? And this is a notion that um, has really been with us throughout uh, human history. Um, since we're in a law school lecture hall, I feel compelled to quote Aristotle, but um, the habits we form from childhood make no small difference. They make all the difference. And so if that's true, this has enormous implications of, uh, for um, parents, clinicians, educators, and I think it's really captured by our modern day philosophers like Calvin, um, who then throw the question back at us, um, how do we know we're doing the right thing by our children? And the reason is these windows of malleability. Um, they, this is a two-edged sword. So in fact, we know of many examples in human society of windows of opportunity. People who have achieved uh, great um, uh, performances, whether in sports or in the arts, um, have usually started early in life and acquired uh, skills that seem extraordinary. And from this point of view, we understand these critical periods as windows of opportunity. But in fact, um, they are also windows of great sensitivity and vulnerability. And in fact, if you think about um, most mental illnesses, they all emerge early in development. And this is just one of uh, any number of slides I could have put up. Um, which captures this notion that um, childhood and adolescence is a time of great vulnerability. And so what we try to address in the laboratory is the biological basis for this, how these early windows of uh, sensitivity come about and reshape our brains. Essentially, we are all born in the world, barring any genetic mishap, with similar circuitry. We know that visual information will go to the back of the head, the auditory to the side, and higher cognitive function to the front. Um, and this is laid out beautifully in utero through a gene program. Um, but what makes us all distinct individuals is this second period when environment can act dramatically on the circuits and shape them to become tailor-made um, hardware for the environments into which we are thrown. And, um, to a greater or lesser extent, it is true that our adult behavior is largely sculpted uh, early in life through these uh, gene environment interactions that shape neural circuitry. And so I will call them critical periods um, because it's just easier to capture it in one term. There's been a long uh, debate, of course, whether they're really critical or sensitive or truly close. But I think um, this term captures the idea of timing. And in fact, the first thing you appreciate is that there are multiple such windows. There's not just one critical period for brain development. There are many, probably as many as there are brain functions. And there's a rough sense of hierarchy we now know. So for example, primary sensory areas, the first filters to the world, tend to be sculpted first and most rigidly. And this segues into um, uh, sensory motor integration, for example, and then higher cognition, which may be much more broadly sculpted throughout um, certainly adolescence and well into our 20s, and maybe even longer. And so the questions we hope to address in the lab are very concrete. What determines the onset timing, the duration, and the closure, if any, of these windows? And of course, we're most interested in human cognition and complex behaviors, but um, it's difficult to study these, especially in laboratory animals. And so uh, historically, the field has started in primary sensory areas. Um, these are uh, single modalities, such as vision, where the inputs are well described. There are only two, in this case, left eye and right eye. And the circuitry is well worked out from the retina to the, the thalamus in the, in the middle of the brain to the visual cortex in the back of our brain. And decades of research has shown that this is a highly plastic circuitry. And uh, plastic in the sense that um, in response to alterations in experience, the circuitry will be sculpted or changed. And so if you were to zoom into the primary visual cortex of a forward viewing animal such as ourselves, a monkey or a cat, you would normally see that the left and right eye input is equally innervating um, the visual cortex. 
And so um, in this illustration, which is probably very familiar to most neuro students, um, we have uh, flattened the visual cortex and made a section through the middle layers, layer four, where the input from the thalamus arrives. And in this case, one eye has been labeled with a tracer in white, and the other is left unlabeled. And so what you get is a pattern of alternating uh, dark and bright stripes, or ocular dominance columns, as they were first called. And in normally forward-viewing animals, um, the amount of territory that serves either the labeled or unlabeled eye is roughly equal. And this is the basis for stereoscopic vision and the ability to integrate information through the two eyes. In classic work, uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel at Harvard Medical School uh, did an experiment where they imbalanced the input to the two eyes. And this is a condition that's um, familiar to humans as a lazy eye or a strabismus. Um, and under those conditions, input from one eye becomes uh, non-salient or um, uh, non-informative. And in fact, in the same uh, kind of paradigm, if you patch the eye of a kitten, for example, and then inject tracer into the open eye after some time, you find that the primary visual cortex is essentially taken over by the good eye or the open eye at the expense of the deprived eye, which only remains poorly connected in these little unlabeled eyelids. <coughs> And so this very well-known form of plasticity, called ocular dominance plasticity, um, is remarkable because it happens so readily early in life and not at all in adult animals. And so there's something that clearly changes. And what's striking to me to this day is that this is a pruning phenomenon that uh, is responding only to experience. There's no damage to the retina, there's no damage to the visual system at all. Simply covering one eye at this critical period would change the physical wiring of the brain. And this has been taken as the canonical model of early life plasticity in response to experience. And we're hoping to understand, starting here, um, how this works. Why is it that the young brain is so malleable and the adult brain not? So if you were to zoom in further into the visual cortex, um, you would find that there are essentially two types of neuron in our brains that can receive this input, excitatory input, excitatory cells and inhibitory cells. Um, the vast majority of cells are excitatory. They use a neurotransmitter called glutamate, and when that's released onto their target cells, it drives the target cells toward firing or being active. And they're surrounded by a minority population that uses GABA as a neurotransmitter. And when this is secreted from these cells onto um, their target cells, it dampens the firing or prevents the target cells from firing action potentials, the language of neurons. And so not surprisingly, uh, ever since Hubel and Weasel first described this phenomenon, um, the field has focused on the excitatory neurons. They're just uh, vastly more numerous and more readily encountered by a recording electrode, for example. And in fact, if you were to zoom in even further, uh, you would see that these dendrites that run uh, north in these cortical layers um, are studded with dendritic spines, which is the site of excitatory synaptic connections. And so you can look now with powerful microscopes at the motility or the pruning of these spines. And there is no doubt that when you patch an eye of an animal, that eventually spines are pruned, and then they regrow in favor of the good eye. So that is um, the rewiring process um, in a nutshell. But it didn't explain why it happens early in life and not so much later in life. Mm -hmm. And so um, try as we might to disrupt this um, uh, pruning process of uh, excitatory connections, it didn't impact the fact that it happens early in life. And so about 20 years ago now, um, we started looking at the inhibitory circuitry. And these cells are um, tough to study because they're so few in number. And as you can tell at a glance, they're quite heterogeneous. The excitatory cells roughly look the same one to the next. They have a pyramidal or triangular cell body with dendrites that run north and axons that run south. Um, and they're similar in shape and function. Now, I admit that probably at a molecular level, they're quite distinct subtypes. But anatomically already, you see the inhibitory cells are quite different. 
So you might have um, these cells that are very narrowly columnar and sending their um, processes up and down, given these uh, uh, beautiful names like a double bouquet of flowers. Um, basket cells, which send their axons not up and down, but laterally, um, and make a basket-type synapse. We'll see a bit more of this in my talk um, to um, mediate the classic lateral inhibition. Other cells, which uh, looked like the ancient candelabra chandeliers in the turn of the last century, uh, where each of the candlestick holders actually makes a very potent synapse right here at the axon initial segment where uh, action poten potentials are generated. And so they're called chandelier cells. And I guess they got, they ran out of names. Um, <laughs> but you get the point. Um, there's still quite a debate how many subtypes of inhibitory neuron are there and why are they so precisely wired up? There must be some logic that basket cells target cells um, uh, laterally and specifically around their cell body, um, whereas these other cells might target the dendri dendrites where the inputs arrive, and these have a chokehold on the output of their target cells. And so uh, the field languished for quite some time because these cells are um, sparse. And uh, we had no good way to systematically study one or another of these subtypes uh, routinely. That's changed dramatically in these past uh, 15 to 20 years. And to make a very long story short, and I'll show you some evidence to back this up, um, we now know that it's the maturation of the inhibitory cells that actually determines when these critical periods happen. And even amongst this uh, vast diversity of cells, it's one subtype in particular that uh, seems to um, mediate the timing. And that's um, this subgroup called the basket cell. So in case you doze off, I'll tell you the punchline first. Um, the summary of my talk is by moving to mouse models, which have um, uh, a variety of advantages, some disadvantages, but many advantages, um, we now know three things. One is that the inhibitory circuits are driving the bus. They're driving the timing of brain plasticity and perhaps a particular cell type. And so our whole question of timing of windows of brain development has been reduced to a cell biology question of this subtype of inhibitory cell. The second point, which I'll get to in the second half, is uh, alluded to in the title, why do these critical periods close? So um, uh, the message is that it could be uh, that we simply passively lose plasticity factors, whatever magical uh, goodies there are in the brain that allow this rewiring to happen. But interestingly, it's become clear in the more recent uh, history, in the past five or six years, that um, the brain actively prevents plasticity. In fact, they make molecules, which I call breaks on plasticity, that, uh, whose job it is to stabilize connections and prevent the plastic change that um, the nervous system wants to undergo. And the upshot of all of this is that critical period timing itself is plastic. And so um, these windows of time, which have long been thought since Aristotle to be set in stone and chronologically determined, actually have a biological basis. And because of that, a whole world of um, consequences uh, emerges, in particular implications for therapeutic approaches to um, brain disorders. So. Um, that's the nutshell summary, and I'll give you some of the um, thoughts we have about this. And I realize this talk is not a science talk purely, and so if I get too uh, distracted by the details, you reel me back in, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, for clarification anytime. So the idea that uh, inhibition is important for um, allowing brain plasticity to occur was quite um, uh, anti-dogmatic, I have to say. Uh, people were uh, very much um, uh, believing that you have to stimulate the brain and excitation is the way to induce change. Um, and here we are saying that actually it's when inhibitory cells uh, kick in that these windows open. And so um, uh, in the lab we're considering a number of possibilities why this might be the case. And this is just to um, give you a flavor of the kind of research currently ongoing. One is that um, inhibition might be a way to sharpen up what we call the signal to noise. So in an immature brain, before these critical periods happen, uh, both on theoretical grounds and actual experimental measurements, we know that there is a lot of spontaneous activity that's not driven by sensory input, for example. 
And so um, it's been uh, well documented that the ultimate um, strengthening or weakening of connections operates on um, uh, conceptually rather simple rules. Neurons that fire together wire together, and neurons that are out of sync lose a link. These are uh, our catchphrases, and of course, decades of work to understand the molecular basis for that. But if um, firing patterns determine whether a synapse gets stronger or weaker, then having a noisy nervous system doesn't help. These rules fail to execute the plasticity. And so if you add a little inhibition, what happens? In fact, the uh, evoked uh, responses get sharper, and the noise is preferentially dampened. And in fact, those rules, um, fire together, wire together, out of sync, lose a link, can finally start to work. That's one possibility, and seems reasonable. Another possibility is that these cells themselves are plastic. And this actually had never been tested before. In fact, there were reasons to believe that inhibitory neurons shouldn't be plastic. Um, many of them contain uh, calcium buffers. And uh, calcium is an all-important molecule for executing plastic change. So um, uh, for many years, uh, there were some people who um, professed that they shouldn't be plastic on a variety of, uh, for a variety of reasons. So um, we started to look. In fact, if you were to um, uh, try to hunt for these inhibitory cells because they're so sparse, it's quite a painstaking undertaking. Uh, but the basket type neuron is a subtype of neuron that has a very characteristic uh, electrophysiological signature. They're called fast spiking cells. If you were to impale one of these cells, you could tell right away because their action potentials are very thin and they can fire at several hundred hertz. They're the hardest working neuron in the cortex. And so by uh, painstaking recordings of identifying just these fast spiking cells, what did we find? It turns out that these cells are dramatically plastic and the same experiment that Hubel and Weasel did 50, 60 years ago actually produces a change in these neurons which is the opposite and complementary to the excitatory cells and in fact happens first. So uh, this is work that replicated our work uh, done by uh, Marcos Frank when he was here actually. Um, he found that uh, as we did in the mice, inhibitory neurons of this type actually normally don't prefer either eye um, and if you patch one eye during a critical period, they shift their response in favor of the closed eye and then later in favor of the open eye. And all of this dynamism happens before the excitatory or principal neurons shift in favor of the open eye. So that was quite a surprise. Now, uh, nowadays, you can actually make mice with um, fluorescent proteins inside this subtype of neuron to make the targeting of the recordings much easier. And um, in fact, uh, Josh Trachtenberg and Sandy Fuhlman replicated our finding that if you uh, target these pardalbumin uh, containing fast spiking basket cells, they will in fact um, show a dramatic reduction of input within one day of closing an eye, well before the excitatory neurons change. So a second reason why inhibition might be important is that they are actually the, the detectors of sensory imbalance. And the third large body of work that um, uh, demonstrates that these cells are important is that you can manipulate the maturational time course of these inhibitory cells. And this has a direct consequence on the timing of these critical periods. So we're in the visual space here. If we were to uh, do something environmental, like raise the animals in total darkness, never a photon of light hitting the eyes, then um, classically we've known and uh, found in mice as well, this uh, leads to a delay of the critical period, meaning that the animals can grow up to be adult age and yet have never entered this window of plasticity. And we know that because we can put them out into the light as a four-month-old um, uh, adult animal, and at that moment, they start to show these uh, responses to patching an eye at an age when they normally wouldn't. And so this suggested that um, uh, you could, in fact, divorce the critical period timing from the age of the animal. And in fact, we now know of all the things that could be going on in the dark, it's a failure of inhibitory cells to mature which causes this delay because you can go into the dark room, for example, and inject something into the animals that 
promotes inhibition in total darkness, and it will um, close out the critical period in that way. If inhibition is important in this way, could you go the other way? In fact, um, mice open their eyes around postnatal day 12, and for about 10 days, there is a window of time when patching an eye has no effect on vision. And uh, in fact, uh, this is a time when inhibitory cells of this type are slowly maturing. And so if you were to boost inhibition during this early time window, what would happen? In fact, you can give a mouse a drug like Valium, a, a, a well-known agonist of GABA receptors, and um, also known as diazepam. And if you do that, then um, this window of plasticity starts and finishes earlier than normal. And so these results uh, were the first demonstration that there is a biological basis for this timing and that it's oddly uh, due to the maturation of inhibitory circuits in the brain. You can have accelerated or delayed windows of brain plasticity. So if you're now thinking uh, bigger picture beyond the visual cortex, then um, this starts to get us into uh, what the implications are, which I'll unpack as we move along here. So knowing that inhibition is important, we can start to revisit certain questions that um, you might have about critical period timing. And um, a, a popular one that I often get is, uh, since these windows happen at particular times in particular brain regions, is it possible that there are clocks in the brain that determine when these windows should happen? And uh, since this uh, uh, body of work, the clock um, genes, just won the Nobel Prize, I thought I would mention this um, work. Um, we know a lot about circadian clocks. And it's a, a very beautiful um, uh, negative transcriptional feedback loop, which uh, has been very well documented in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And we know that certain transcription factors called clock and BMAL drive downstream circadian genes, which then repress this interaction, and you create a genetic oscillator. But since uh, the initial description, we now know that such oscillators exist throughout the body and brain. And we wondered, um, is there circadian gene expression in the visual cortex, not in a traditional um, circadian uh, region? And so Yohei Kobayashi in the lab uh, took samples of the visual cortex in adult animals and found that indeed there is a circadian oscillation of these genes in the visual cortex. But if you were to look earlier at the time of eye opening, these oscillations don't yet uh, emerge. And in fact, they start to ramp up just after eye opening and start to show this nice di uh, diurnal rhythm as the critical period was being engaged. I'm not going to go through all the detail, but give you just the conclusion. If we were to manipulate a uh, clock and disrupt uh, this circadian uh, gene oscillation or dampen it severely, then what happens is that the critical period timing is delayed. And so unlike um, uh, wild type mice, the visual cortex becomes plastic much later at a time when wild type animals are already past their window of plasticity. And because that's a condition that we're familiar with, uh, we try to rescue it. So maybe you can rescue a clock, knock out mouse, uh, and restore the critical period timing by boosting inhibition. In fact, you could by giving a benzodiazepine drug like Valium. And you could also mimic this uh, phenotype that's seen in the total clock knockout by knocking clock out of only these fast spiking parvalbumin positive cells. If you knock it out of the uh, majority cell type, the excitatory cells, there is no effect on the critical period timing. So it's possible that there is some kind of clock machinery intrinsic to these fast spiking cells that dictates uh, timing of these uh, critical periods. This finding has a number of implications already, um, and I'll just mention a few of them. Um, so, for example, now that we know the development of inhibitory cells is a sort of trigger, then um, would it be possible to reintroduce a second critical period if you were to transplant uh, embryonic uh, or stem cells of these inhibitory cell types? And that experiment, as crazy as it sounds, has actually been done. Um, and you can do this because inhibitory neurons are born um, in a region called the medial ganglionic eminence, quite far from the final resting place in the cerebral cortex. 
And so Arturo Alvarez Buya, Mike Stryker uh, at UCSF, scooped out uh, this uh, source of inhibitory neurons from uh, the embryo and transplanted it into postnatal uh, brain. And what they found was, in fact, you can reintroduce a second critical period. But what was striking in this work is that it doesn't happen right away as soon as you transplant something. It happens about a month after the transplant has been made, consistent with some kind of timing mechanism that uh, might be playing out as these cells are maturing and integrating into the local circuitry. A second implication is that um, circadian genes have been linked to a variety of mental illnesses, some of which are listed here. And um, a common interpretation is that, of course, if you have a broken circadian oscillator, then just like anyone who's been jet lagged, your cognition will suffer. But in fact, our results suggest an alternative or an additional uh, explanation that perhaps people who carry this sort of um, uh, problem might in fact have suffered delayed or shifted critical periods of development along the way. And so you might want to know that early on in order to potentially intervene and recorrect the timing. I've talked about the visual system as a model, but I really want to uh, make this as a general point. The idea that critical periods themselves are movable has uh, really uh, impacted other fields as well. I'll just give you one example, and that is the development of the prefrontal limbic system. Um, this is the system that involves fear, fear recognition, emotion regulation um, in the hippocampus, amygdala, and prefrontal cortex circuit. And evidence is building that uh, animals, or humans for that matter, um, raised under early life stress or neglect, institutionalization, um, will in fact show an earlier closure of critical periods relevant for this circuitry. Um, and so that's quite a double whammy. Not only are these kids not getting the appropriate uh, parental care or interaction with uh, caregivers, they're also closing out the window of opportunity to shape those circuits. Now this is probably very adaptive under these kinds of conditions. As you can imagine, if you're growing up under a, um, um, a highly inconstant environment, uh, you need to uh, mature these circuits fast and be ready for an unstable world and deal with um, a fearful uh, uh, environment. So this is biology playing out as it should. Um, but we need to be aware of this. If you were to study any human who walked into the room and knew nothing about their early life stress, um, the, the brain state and the, the condition in the classroom, for example, could be quite different from uh, one person to the next. The uh, other major implication is I've been saying that one subtype of inhibitory neuron, these basket type cells, are essentially a biomarker of when these windows of plasticity might occur. They're called basket cells because they make a nest-like synapse around the cell body. And this is a drawing from 100 years ago by Ramoni Cajal, which captures this idea. You can almost see the pyramidal cell body here surrounded by um, these boutons. Pictures like this don't really tell you, though, um, whether the basket is formed by one axon which proliferates or is the convergence of many such cells. And so fast forward to today, we can use this uh, fluorescent painting technology. Um, uh, this one is developed by Josh Sains and Jeff Lickman, my neighbors at Harvard, called Brainbow, um, where you can literally paint in different fluorescent colors through a clever stochastic <laughs> trick of fluorescent protein expression. And now the question becomes quite straightforward. By counting the numbers of different colored boutons, you can know um, the degree of convergence, how many uh, synapses does any given cell contribute to this um, basket, and how does that change with early life experience, early life stress, uh, or genetic uh, mishap, or so on. Um, interestingly, these cells um, also themselves uh, change as they pass through the uh, critical period. So while the maturation of these connections is turning on the plastic window, as they come out of the critical period, they acquire an extracellular <coughs> coating, which we call a perineuronal net. Um, and that's labeled here uh, in purple. And I'll try and play this movie. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, yeah, see, <laughs> it throws me out of my PowerPoint. But um, uh, these nets, uh, you'll see another one in a second, um, actually um, 
are like a saran wrapping around the cell body. And um, in blue or uh, teal, you see um, synaptic boutons or other inputs onto this cell which are perforating or puncturing holes in the saran wrap. And so um, this structure has um, really uh, fascinated uh, researchers of late that perhaps um, it becomes tighter and tighter around these cells as the critical period closes because it traps the synapses and prevents further change. Um, and a very fanciful idea is that if you could unroll these um, uh, perineuronal nets, as we are now doing with super resolution microscopy, you could read the punch card of the life history of that cell by knowing who those synapses are. So we have a bookend on critical period timing. At least in the visual cortex, we know the maturation of these basket synapses turns on the window, and ultimately this wrapping around the cell turns it off, or is correlated with the closure. So if you go around the brain of the mouse, you find that these cells mature at different rates in different brain regions. And I've been telling you about the visual critical period, where visual acuity is um, uh, shaped. That peaks around one month after birth. But in fact, these cells are developing at earlier time points in the somatosensory system or the auditory system and so on. And so it predicts that these critical periods should be staggered, that uh, there's a biological reason why there may be a sequential development. So you could test this idea. What if we go to the auditory domain um, in the mouse? Um, the auditory system, uh, as I mentioned, um, is innervating from the ear to the lateral side of the cortex. So we're now here, not at the back of the brain where the vision is processed. And uh, in fact, you can uh, do an experiment that shows a very nice competitive uh, plasticity during an earlier critical period in the mouse. And that is, if you were to raise an animal listening to tones of a particular frequency, then the map in the auditory cortex, which represents those tones, is, becomes distorted. So um, what's represented here in this rainbow pattern is a normally raised animal whose um, representation of sound frequency now, not the two eyes, but uh, tones, is roughly equally distributed from low to high frequency as you move from the back to the front of the auditory cortex. If you were to raise a, a mouse listening to one tone repeatedly, the seven kilohertz, for example, in this kind of yellow, lime green color, um, and then to map the auditory cortex, you would see that there's an expansion of the overrepresented sound at the expense of neighboring frequencies. I hope you can see that. So there's a, a competitive takeover of the auditory cortex in response to the sound that uh, the animal grew up with. And in fact, as predicted by these inhibitory cells maturing earlier in this part of the brain, this window is at postnatal day 12 to um, 15. So a very short window of time. And it has lasting consequences, just like the lazy eye amblyopia situation. These recordings are made in adult animals, well after this three-day exposure to sound. And in fact, uh, it's a situation um, very similar in many ways to the visual model. Um, there is no damage to the auditory system. We've just changed what the animal hears. And as a result, the lower animal hears the world differently throughout life compared to the upper animal, the naive mouse. Well, how is that relevant to us? Well, it's relevant to all of us because it turns out infants are born into the world capable of hearing speech sounds of any language. You could go to Japan and test a newborn infant and find that she can hear R and L quite fine, just like a baby born in the United States. If you go back six months later, these infants who have been showered only in Japanese throughout that whole time, where RL discrimination is not important, have already lost the ability to hear R from L. Mm -hmm. And if you imagine that's just the beginning of a language uh, acquisition, then it's no wonder that um, uh, people in Japan, and I've had many postdocs in my lab who do this, will freely interchange R and L even in their writing, because to them, it's exactly the same thing. And in fact, language, we think, is a series of critical periods which are hierarchically stacked in a kind of bootstrapping fashion, starting with this kind of perceptual narrowing, and then eventually uh, segueing into um, multimodal integration, um, seeing the configuration of the speaker's face, the lips and the eyes and so forth, 
to be matched with the sounds produced by that individual, and so on, all the way up to uh, complex um, grammatical and um, uh, semantic differences in languages, which have been mapped by MRI in bilingual subjects. So individuals who are acquiring a second language late in life, after the age of 11, typically activate two discrete spots uh, in response to their native and second acquired language. But this is different from people who were raised in a multilingual environment who activate the same spot in Broca's area in response to the two native languages, if you will. And so clearly, um, when um, this uh, experience happens, shapes the way the brain is activated. And if you just take this um, result for a moment, um, there was a, an interesting cutoff around the age of 11 across uh, at least a dozen different language pairs, related pairs like uh, Romance languages, but also quite different ones, um, that all said the same thing. And then you think about education and the fact that second language learning is typically introduced at school and sadly in this country, even later, almost perfectly timed to miss the critical period. Um, then you have to wonder, um, is Calvin right? Are we doing the right thing? So uh, I just thought it would be fun to test this. I don't know if any of you are Hindi speakers. Anybody? Yes? OK, so a few of you might hear this. Um, this is Janet Worker, our colleague, um, who is uh, one of the pioneers of um, uh, language uh, development. She studies, uh, she's in Vancouver, and uh, she's been using uh, Hindi-specific uh, phonemes to map when this perceptual narrowing happens in infants. And I think the sound is up. Um, this is a ta-da discrimination, which, since I don't speak Hindi, I can't tell the difference, and maybe most of you won't either. Um, but if I play them, um, they have subtly different um, spectrograms, sound spectrograms, frequency versus time. But let's see if you can hear this. Ta. Ta. You heard the difference? <laughs> OK, so using this kind of test in infants and measuring physiological readouts, um, uh, like heart rate or uh, suckling and so on, you can actually map out these windows. Um, Janet was one of the um, uh, people who was quite adventurous in testing the idea whether critical periods might move in humans just as they do in animals. And uh, we showed a way to do that. If you were to expose a young pre-critical period uh, individual to a drug that alters the excitatory inhibitory balance, as we say, then um, these windows should shift. And in um, an early study, we found that this was actually the case. Uh, infants exposed to SRI antidepressant drugs showed an earlier closure of this critical period instead of at six months, already by four months of age, this window had closed. And subsequently, also the audiovisual matching window had closed uh, earlier. Um, and um, this study really introduced me to the complexity of uh, human studies because what is the appropriate control group? Um, in, of course, we would compare uh, infants to uh, infants exposed to um, antidepressants because the mother was depressed and taking these drugs in pregnancy to healthy infants born to healthy mothers who don't need the drugs, but also to depressed mothers who didn't take the drugs. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that in the latter case, these windows actually shifted later in time. Um, we don't have a, a good, strong explanation for that yet, uh, but it could be that depressed mothers spend less face time with their infants, and it's a sort of deprivation um, that might have produced that effect. But this was an example of an idea from the mouse work now translating to the human that exposure to drugs that have consequences on this trajectory of excitatory inhibitory balance might have an impact on um, brain plasticity windows in humans. And it was a pilot study, so of course we're now curious how these 10-year-old uh, kids have done in their language. But uh, fortunately for us, last year, Jay Gingrich and colleagues in Finland did a much more highly powered study, uh, taking advantage of the Scandinavian record keeping. Uh, they were able to study 845,000 documented birds um, during this time period. Uh, uh, 1996 to 2010, identify um, uh, pregnancies that involve SRI exposure on the order of uh, 15,000 compared to um, kids born to uh, parents with psychiatric illnesses that didn't involve SRI antidepressants. Uh, 
and as well as healthy uh, diagnosed, um, undiagnosed, I guess, um, uh, births. And then follow up and see what is the consequence on language and uh, speech acquisition on standardized tests as they entered school. And what they report is that there is a 37% increased risk of speech and or language disorder among these offspring exposed to SRIs. It's a large gap between uh, perinatal exposure, critical periods moving, and this ultimate outcome at several years of age. But it's consistent with the idea that even a slight jitter early in life might have downstream consequences. And of course, this number might be an underrepresentation because if your child is deviating from some trajectory, most good parents will try to intervene. And so um, this is just uh, uh, very recent, just last year, um, uh, follow up on this idea. But what I've been trying to convey to you is that um, it's a repeated uh, phenomenon that throughout the cerebral cortex, this balance of excitatory and one subtype of inhibitory cell is uh, routinely found to sculpt long-range projections, whether it's from the visual or auditory or somatosensory thalamus or perhaps other projections to higher order cognitive areas. And in uh, Boston Children's Hospital, we're particularly interested in um, neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism, which are uh, well known to be associated with excitatory inhibitory imbalance. And so you might expect that uh, slight jitter in sensory areas will then cascade as these critical periods um, uh, fall in domino fashion and <clears throat> manifest as some complex cognitive disorder by age three um, because of this uh, excitatory inhibitory um, imbalance. And so, you know, you might be able then to correct some trajectory like this by intervening and putting the trajectory back on track. This is something we do now um, uh, in uh, monogenic disorders like Rett syndrome, which is a deficiency of a particular gene called MECP2. The mouse can be created, where, which lacks the same gene. And uh, we found first that these mice actually um, uh, show a regression of vision as measured using a visually evoked potential from the scalp. Um, no one at that time in the clinic across the street would have thought to look at vision in uh, autism. And in fact, once we convinced Chuck Nelson to do it with us, we found immediately the first 17 patients showed a regression of vision. And parents would have told you, oh yes, my daughter is sitting closer and closer to the television, but um, it hadn't been measured in quite this way. In fact, if you just look at the evoked potential, the shape of this waveform, then um, you see that in the mouse it progressively gets smaller and broader. And the same thing happens uh, from a neurotypical individual here in black. Um, it gets smaller and broader. And so this takes us back to the lab where we can try to treat the circuit problem and not necessarily have to fix the gene in God knows which part of the brain um, we would have to do that. I'm, getting, I'm running out of time, so I think I'm going to switch gears and introduce the other concept that um, now that we know the critical periods are malleable uh, and movable thanks to this uh, maturation of inhibition, um, what turns them off? As I said, uh, the historical thinking has been we simply lose it with age. It's kind of a depressing way to look at things. Um, as we get older, uh, it's a kind of once and done uh, event because these plasticity factors, and there are many, um, might simply disappear or become harder to tap. Um, we started to take uh, an, a more open approach to this question um, and think that, well, it might also be important to stabilize circuitry and actively prevent rewiring. And in fact, this has been some of the more exciting uh, work more recently, that in fact, uh, there are things that disappear with age. But we also find several factors that come up with age that act like brakes and suppress um, plasticity. So um, some of you might have noticed in passing that uh, I mentioned you can move the onset of the window earlier with a, a simple manipulation like thallium exposure. Um, the closure followed suit after a fixed amount of time. And this suggested to us that um, a gene program may be unleashed that uh, executes the plastic rewiring and putting on the brakes and closing of the critical period. And so uh, one kind of uh, manipulation that could be done is epigenetic. This is to unwind the DNA in an otherwise adult animal and expose uh, genes for expression that might be involved in this process in the younger animal. 
and um, uh, such drugs exist, uh, such as histone deacetylase inhibitors, HDAC inhibitors. And if you give an adult uh, rodent an HDAC inhibitor like valproic acid, you can make their brain young again. You can actually allow um, patching of an eye to become, to induce amblyopia, uh, uh, a shift away from the deprived eye, or you could rescue visual acuity, which had been compromised by an earlier deprivation. This, these drugs are admittedly quite crude, but now we can use um, uh, transcriptomic approaches and sort individual neurons and find what's the impact of these cells and find that, in fact, um, it eerily recapitulates the earlier critical period in the sense that the mature inhibitory cells are the first to be reset to a juvenile state, followed several days later by the excitatory cells, and that, uh, for whatever reason, this one class of drug actually plays out in a, a time sequence to um, uh, mimic the critical period as it happens in development. These drugs are also clinically available. So valproic acid is known as Depakote to some of you. Um, it's given in uh, bipolar disorder, but also um, to treat seizures. And so um, we have the opportunity again with Janet Worker to test whether valproate treatment uh, would in fact reopen a critical period type of plasticity in humans. And uh, there are several such um, phenomena, such as the perceptual narrowing uh, to native or non-native speech sounds, um, the ability to discriminate individual animal faces also undergoes a perceptual narrowing, um, the ability to detect perfect pitch, um, the, the pitch of a tone without benefit of a reference tone. These kinds of things close out in the first several years of life unless you're trained on them. And um, in fact, we could take uh, a young uh, group of uh, individuals in their mid to late 20s and under valproate train them on these kinds of tests to see if um, critical periods were rejuvenated. And in fact, um, it's very hard to change the adult brain. Uh, if you give this drug just for two weeks as we were doing, uh, not much changes, but we actually saw improvement on absolute pitch. Um, and this uh, caused a bit of a stir um, and the story went viral, and this is part of the reason why I'm mentioning it here. Um, you know, we can never take these things out of context. This was published a few years ago, and it was meant to be a proof of principle that this idea of manipulating plasticity in the adult based on uh, biological experiments in animals is possible. Uh, but uh, you can imagine to this day I still get emails from musicians or wannabe musicians <laughs> and other people who want to make their brain better. Another example is uh, the cholinergic system. We found that in our screen for uh, molecules that come up with age is a molecule that dampens the impact of acetylcholine, uh, which is a neuromodulator that showers the brain during moments of heightened arousal or attention. And it acts on uh, two types of receptor, one of which is an ion channel, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. This is the channel that's tickled by smoking. And in fact, um, the molecule we found to increase with age was called Lynx-1, uh, which is very well known to Amida, um, who studied it in the fruit fly initially. Um, and this molecule has a structure that looks like uh, alpha bungarotoxin. So for the uh, neuroscience students, I hope you all remember alpha bungarotoxin. <laughs> it's the uh, active component of snake venom. And so when a snake bites its prey, it can paralyze the prey by secreting a molecule that blocks the nicotinic receptor in muscle. It turns out as we all grow older, we make a prototoxin in our head. And its function is in fact to dampen or uh, lessen the action of nicotinic receptors. And so that seemed peculiar. Um, this system, as I said, is involved in attention or arousal. And so uh, we started to test whether animals lacking Lynx-1 would be more attentive because they don't dampen their nicotinic receptors. And so you can train an animal to do a behavior. My videos are all messed up, but if you um, look at the animal here, they're trained to touch a screen wherever a stimulus appears. And the trial starts by them poking in the reward tray. You can make the attentional demand harder by making the stimulus brief and the animals miss it if they're not paying attention. This is typical of um, a wild-type mouse. If you look at the lynx-swan knockout mice, however, um, you find that they are extremely attentive. 
and they're always right up there at the front of the screen. That was already the more difficult one, uh, 200 millisecond stimulus. They come back, and you'll see that they are some of our best students, actually. <laughs> So you get the idea that by enhancing uh, cholinergic uh, transmission, these animals are um, uh, more attentive. And it turned out, as we might have predicted, it comes up with age in correlation with the closure of this critical period. And so if we get rid of it, maybe we can extend the window of brain plasticity. And in fact, that's true. Uh, here are the data from the visual cortex. If uh, the most clinically relevant example, if we uh, patch one eye to deliberately cause a loss of visual acuity in these animals, what would happen when you reopen the eye? In wild type animals, there's no recovery of visual acuity, hence the critical period, um, if you reopen the eye after its peak. But in these mice, they fully recover vision by reopening the eye, which is pretty amazing because to this day there is no cure for amblyopia after the age of 10 in humans, and it's quite a problem for people to um, have depth perception. Um, so one strategy might be to develop a new drug, like a Lynx-1 inhibitor, that might uh, allow us to rekindle plasticity. Uh, but we already know how it works. It dampens acetylcholine function. So you could maybe <coughs> override this break by giving a drug that already exists that prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine. And in this way, you can drive this system better. And in fact, you can do that to a wild-type mouse, give cholinesterase inhibitor to prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine, and this restores vision in the mouse. Um, and so this leads us to a, another opportunity. Here's a drug commonly sold as a drug called Aricept, which is used in um, Alzheimer's disease, because uh, in Alzheimer's disease, the cholinergic neurons degenerate. And so it's a kind of last gasp effort to keep the acetylcholine around. And uh, pilot a clinical trial as we are in the ophthalmology department at Children's to see if we can restore vision repurposing this drug in younger individuals who um, have missed the window for treating their amblyopia. There may also be uh, more clever ways to uh, allow this acetylcholine release. And in rodents, it turns out that exercise is a very powerful way to release neuromodulators like acetylcholine. And um, you can, in fact, stimulate um, a, a part of the midbrain which drives locomotion. Um, and this will shower the cortex with acetylcholine. This can be done electrically, or uh, the more fancy version these days is to use optogenetics, which is to um, uh, have a, a light-sensitive channel expressed in this region. And then with a small optic fiber, you can, um, with light, stimulate these neurons. And I hope the video will play here. Um, yeah. So soon you'll see the blue light flashing, and the mouse starts running on a wheel, and it doesn't know why. The light <laughs> shuts off, it stops running. And um, you can repeat this endlessly. <laughs> Every time the light is on, we know that the cortex is getting acetylcholine. This is work from Mike Stryker's lab. And uh, if you were to pair this running with visual input, for example, um, what would happen? So you put a monitor in front of the animal, and uh, you can have the animal experiencing a natural scene, or horizontal bars, or nothing, and then later test them on horizontal bars. And what you find is that you get very specific enhancement of responses, or plasticity. So you see that there's an increase in response to the pattern the animal was seeing while running. And so there's a specific uh, specificity here to using this system to tap into brain plasticity. Um, I won't belabor the mechanism. We now know that particular cells have the right combination of links and the nicotinic receptor. And that's why in this example from the auditory cortex, young animals which don't yet have links are in their critical period, as I mentioned, are very responsive to nicotine. Um, as they grow into adulthood, these receptors are dampened by the action of this molecule. If you were to delete links one, even as adults, they retain this juvenile, uh, easily activated um, uh, response. So I'm going to skip this part and just say that um, what we've learned is that there's a biological reason for these critical periods, and that, in fact, uh, we can reverse engineer it now. And this sounds pretty exciting, because you might have conditions 
like a deviant uh, trajectory where you might want a second chance to recorrect or you might suffer a traumatic brain injury in adulthood and want a, a juvenile form of brain plasticity and so forth. Um, but of course, you can easily take this too far and wonder, well, this is great. I can learn French overnight and uh, go have a great uh, vacation in Europe. But um, there is a reason why all this effort is put in through evolution to turn down or tune down the plasticity. And I just want to end on this point. So those perineuronal nets that I mentioned to you serve a number of purposes. Um, on the left is an artist's rendering. It's a kind of um, uh, scaffolding that traps synapses and prevents further plastic change. We now know that if you um, strip away these nets in the adult by injecting an enzyme that degrades them, you can reopen this critical period just like those other examples I mentioned to you. And this is because the cells that have this net are so specific. It's these basket-type neurons, which we've been finding turn on the critical period in the first place. So basically, you dissolve this net, and you are able to reset these cells to a juvenile state. The molecular mechanisms for this involve the fact that these nets are, are actually quite a molecular uh, structure that can attract a variety of factors growth factors, such as those listed here, which are trapped into these cells by this perineuronal net and keeps them in this mature, fast spiking state. So there's a quite a bit of biology now behind these structures explaining how they uh, keep the, the mature nervous system in its mature state. And removing the net or removing any of these molecules like OTX2, which is one that we study, will actually rejuvenate or reset these cells to a an immature state and in fact reopen brain plasticity. The reason you don't want to do this is that the nets are very sensitive to oxidative stress. And in fact, the third major function, apart from trapping synapses and collecting growth factors, is to protect these very fast spiking neurons from their own demise. Mm -hmm. And so in fact, um, if you were to um, compromise the antioxidant uh, systems in in uh, these animals, which happens commonly in mental illnesses, you find that those parvalbumin basket cells, which have a weak net, show uh, the strongest signature of oxidative damage. So here's a neuron that has a strong net, has very little oxidative damage. These cells with a weak net have uh, a strong uh, DNA damage signature. And so this is uh, perhaps why, in part, critical periods are closing, is to protect the system from damage. If you look at the molecules in, in these nets across the human brain, um, this had already been done well before people appreciated the function of these nets. In Alzheimer's disease, it's very well known that um, there's a last in, first out pathology. Those higher order associational areas that humans have evolved to be plastic longer throughout life that mice don't have uh, are the least endowed with these um, perineuronal nets and these structures. And so it's consistent. We have more plasticity um, because we don't put on the brakes there. But the consequence, perhaps, is now that we live long enough, these areas degenerate first. And in fact, if we knock out links, these animals are better at everything we've tested them on. But oddly, they develop a neurodegenerative pathology around 10 months to a year. And so we've humanized the mouse to be more uh, attentive and more plastic, and we've also given them uh, degeneration vulnerability. So mm -hmm. this might be a consequence. In schizophrenia, it's the same across, this was just published this year, uh, across a wide variety of genetic and environmental models of schizophrenia. They all converge on oxidative stress and impairment of these perineuronal nets, which you can see in the postmortem brain tissue. There are fewer of these net-like structures in uh, schizophrenic subjects. So I just want to end by saying that uh, these um, uh, critical periods exist for a reason. They're very well regulated biologically. Um, there have been surprises, uh, such as the importance of inhibitory cells and the existence of active mechanisms to suppress plasticity. And that perhaps if you don't close out the critical period, it leads to a brief moment of extended plasticity but then it leads to pathology.
And so the idea of balancing a plastic state and a stable state is extremely important and it is um, evolutionarily conserved from mouse to human. The title of my talk actually comes from a quote by Baudelaire who said that genius is nothing more nor less than childhood recovered at will. And I think this is kind of what we all are hoping for, not to lose our identity when we reopen a critical period, but to be able to regulate it that way. So I'm sorry I went a little over time. This is um, uh, the group of folks who've been involved in this work. Um, they've been on the slides and mentioned along the way. And I want to thank all of them and all of you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions.